Chapter 16 of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But they did not kill the master before nightfall. It was not quite practicable. Bell and Jameson started out well before dawn with a favorable wind and tide in the small launch the wizened Welshman placed at their disposal. His air was one of dour piety, but he accepted Bell's offer of money with an obvious relief and criticized his Paraguayan currency with an acid frankness until Jameson produced Argentine pesos sufficient to pay for the boat three times over. I think, said Jameson dryly, that Paul, that Miss Canahalis is safe enough until we come back. The keeper is a godly man and knows we have money. She'll be in no danger except for her soul. They may try to save that. Bell did not answer. He could think of nothing but the mission he had set himself. He tinkered with the engine to make it speed up and set the sails with infinite care to take every possible advantage of the stiff breeze that blew. During the day, those sails proved almost as much of a nuisance as a help. The fiendish, sullen, willy -waws that blow furiously without warning about the strait required watching, and more than once it was necessary to reef everything and depend on the motor alone. Bell watched the horizon ahead with smoldering eyes. Jameson watched him almost worriedly. Look here, Bell, he said at last. You'll get nowhere feeling like you do. I know you've done the master more damage than I have, but you'll just run your head into a trap unless you use your brains. For instance, you didn't ask about communications. There's a direct telegraph wire from Cape Virgins to Buenos Aires, and there's telephonic communication between the Cape and Punta Arenas. Do you imagine that the plane wasn't seen when it came in the Cape? And do you imagine the master doesn't know we're here? Bell turned then and frowned blackly. I hadn't thought of it, he said grimly, but I put some hand grenades in the locker there. You damn fool, said Jameson angrily. Stop being bloodthirsty and use your head. You haven't even asked what I've done. I've done something anyhow. That bundle I chucked in the bow has a couple of sheepmen's outfits in it. Lots of sheep raised around here. We'll put them on before we land. And like a good general, I arranged the method of retreat before we left B.A. There'll be a naval vessel here in two or three days. She's carrying a party of government scientists. She'll anchor in Punta Arenas Harbor and announce a case of some infectious disease on board. No shore leave, you see, and nobody from shore permitted on board her. And she has one or two damned good analytical chemists with a damned good laboratory on board her, too. It's a long gamble, but if we can get hold of some of the master's poison, do you see? Yes, said Bell heavily, I see, but you haven't been through what I've been through. What I've done, fighting that devil, has caused men to be deserted after being enslaved. There's one place, Cuyaba. His face twitched. That place was in his dreams now. That place and others where human beings had watched their bodies go mad and had been carried about screaming with horror at the crimes those bodies committed. I'm going to kill the master, he rasped, that's all. He settled down to his grim watch for the city. All during the cloudy, overcast day, he strained his eyes ahead. Jameson could make nothing of him. In the end, he had to leave Bell to his moody waiting. The morning passed, and midday, and a long afternoon. Three times Bell came restlessly back to the engine and tried to coax more speed out of it. But when darkness fell, the town was still not in sight. They kept on, then, steering by the stars, with the motor putt-putt-putting sturdily away in the stern. The water splashed and washed all about them. The little boat rose and fell and rose and fell again. That's the town, said Bell grimly. It was eleven at night or later. Lights began to appear very far away, dancing mirage-like on the edge of the water. They grew nearer 
with almost infinite slowness. Two wide bands of many lights, with a darker space in which a few much brighter lights showed clearly. Presently, a single red light appeared, the Punta Arenas Harbor light, twenty-five feet up on an iron pole. They passed it. Bell, said Jameson curtly, it's time you showed some sense now. We're going to find out some things before we get reckless. This town isn't a big one, but it always was a hell on earth. No extradition from here. It's full of wanted men. It's dying now. From the old days, when all ships passed the straits before the Panama Canal opened up. But it ought to be still a hell on earth. And we're going to put on these sheepmen's outfits and put up at some low-caste sailors and sheepmen's hotel on shore and find out what is what. In the morning, if you like. In the morning, said Bell coldly, I'm going to settle with the master. They found a small and filthy hotel in a still filthier street where the houses were alternately black and silent and empty, and filled with the squalid hilarity most seaport towns can somehow manage to support. The street lamps were white and cold. The dirt and squalor showed the more plainly by their light. There were sailors from a few ships in harbor, and women so haggard and bedraggled that shrill laughter and lavish endearments remained their only allure and Bell and Jameson plotted to the reeking place in which a half-drunk sheepman pointed, and there Bell sat grimly in the vermin-infested room while Jameson, swearing wryly, went out. He came back later, much later. His breath was strong of bad whiskey, and he looked like a man who feels that a bath would be very desirable. He looked like a man who feels unclean. "'Give me a cigarette,' he said shortly. I found out most of what we want to know. Bell gave him a cigarette and waited. Good thing you stayed behind, said Jameson. I want to vomit. Why people go in hell holes for fun? But I was very drunk and very amorous. Picked up a woman and fed her liquor. Young, too, damnation. She got crying drunk and told me everything she knew. I gave her money and left. Punta Arenas is the master's body and soul. One could have guessed it, said Bell grimly. Nothing like it is, said Jameson. Every living creature, man, woman, and child, has been fed that devilish poison of his. The keepers of the dives go fawning to the local officials for the antidote. The jefe politico is driven in his carriage to be cured when red spots form before his eyes. The damned place is full of suicides and women and, oh, my God, it's horrible. A humming, buzzing noise set off in the night somewhere. It kept up for a long time, throttled down. Suddenly, it seemed to grow louder, changed in pitch, and dwindled, as if into the far, far distance. That's one of the master's planes now, no doubt, said Jameson savagely, going off on some errand for him. He uses this place practically as an experiment station. The human beings here are his guinea pigs. The deputies get a standardized form of the stuff, but he's got it worked out in different doses, so we can make a man go mad in hours if he chooses, instead of after a delay. I don't know how. And the master? He checked himself sharply. There were shuffling footsteps in the hall outside, a timid tap on the door. Jameson opened it while Bell dropped one hand inconspicuously to a weapon inside his shapeless clothing. The toothless and filthy old man who kept the hotel beamed in at them. Senors, he crackled, Vede son de porvenir, no es verdad? Jameson hiccuped, as one who has been out and been drunken ought to do. No veos, he rumbled tipsily. Somos de la estancia del señor Rubio. Vaya. The old man seemed to mourn that they did not come from the sheep ranches about Porvenir Bay, but he produced a bottle with a shaking hand, still beaming. Tengo muchos amigos en Porvenir, he chirped amiably. Y cuesta botella? 
Demila, rumbled Jameson. He reached out his hand. No mas que poquito, said the old man, beaming but anxious as Jameson tilted it to his lips. Es whisky de gentes. He beamed upon Bell, and Bell swallowed a spoonful and seemed to swallow vastly more. He lay back lazily while Jameson, in the part of a tipsy sheep herder, bullied the old man amiably and eventually chased him out. You're amused, asked Jameson sardonically, when there were no more sounds outside, because I said you didn't want to meet the young senorita who loved you when she saw you downstairs. Well, Bell, if you use your brain, you didn't swallow any of that stuff. Bell started up. Jameson caught him by the shoulder. I'm not sure, he said sharply. Of course not. But it's damn funny for a Spanish hotel keeper to give something for nothing, even when he seemed just to want to gossip about his friends. Here, drink this water. It looks vile enough to take the place of mustard. Next morning, the hotel keeper beamed upon them both as they went out of the place. A slatternly, dark-haired girl, who leaned on his shoulder, smiled invitingly at Bell. And Bell, in his character of a loutish sheepman, from one of the rancheros that dot the shores of the strait, grinned awkwardly back. But he went on with Jameson. We separate, said Jameson under his breath. We want to find where the master lives, mostly. And then we want to find the laboratory where his stuff is mixed. We don't want to do any killing until that's settled. After all, the trade has something to say. Bell caught it indifferently and began to wander idly about the streets, turning here and there, as if moved by nothing more than the vaguest curiosity. But gradually he was working through the sections in which the larger buildings stood. Concrete structures, astonishingly modern, dotted the business section. But none of them had an air that would surround the place where a man with power or life or death would be. In a town the size of Punta Arenas, there would be unmistakable evidence about the master's residence, even if it were only that those who passed it did so hurriedly and with a twinge of fear. There were prosperous men in plenty on the streets, mingled with deserting sailors, stockmen, and farmers from the villages along the strait, and even a few grimy men who looked like miners. But there is a lignite mine not far from the city, and a narrow-gauge railroad running to it. Of the prosperous-seeming men, however, Bell picked out one here and there, toward whom all passerbys adopted a manner of cringing respect. Bell lounged against a pole and studied them thoughtfully. Men with an air of amused and careless scorn, which only men with unlimited power may adopt. He saw one grossly fat man with hard and cruel eyes. The uniformed policeman drove all traffic abjectly out of the way of his carriage and stood with lifted hat until he had passed. The fat man gave not the faintest sign of acknowledgment. I wonder, said Bell slowly and very grimly, if that's the master. And then a passerby dodged quickly past his shoulder, brushing against him, and waited humbly in the street. Bell turned. A party of men were taking up nearly all the sidewalk. There were half a dozen of them in all, and nearly in the middle was the bulky, immaculate, pigmented Ribiera. Bell stiffened. But the move, beyond clearing the way, would be to attract attention. He backed clumsily off the curbing, as if making way. And Ribiera looked at his face. Bell's hand drifted near his hidden weapon. But Ribiera looked neither surprised nor alarmed. He halted and chuckled. Ah, Senor Bell. Bell said nothing, looking as stupid as possible, merely because... There was nothing else to do. Ah, oh, do not deny my acquaintance, said Ribiera. He laughed. I advise you to go and look at the view over the harbor. Good day, Senor Bell. Laughing, he went off along the street, and Bell felt a cold horror creeping over him 
as he realized what Ribiera might mean. Ribiera had entirely too much against him to greet him only in a town where even the dogs dared not bark without the master's express command. He had guards with him, men who would have shot Bell down at a nod from Ribiera. Bell burst into a mad run for the waterfront. When the bay spread out before his eyes, he saw what Ribiera meant, and something seemed to snap in his brain. The plane in which he and Jameson and Paula had escaped was floating out in the harbor. It was unmistakable. A larger, bulkier seaplane floated beside it. The buzzing in the air the night before, the arrival of the plane had been telephoned from Cape Virgins. Through a glass, perhaps, even its alighting had been watched. And a big seaplane had gone out to bring it back. Footprints in the sand would lead toward the lighthouse. There would be plenty of men to storm that, if necessary, to take the three fugitives. But they would have found only Paula. It was quite possible that the plane had only been sent for after Bell and Jameson had been seen to land in Punta Arenas, and Paula, in the master's hands, would explain Ribiera's amusement perfectly. Bell found Jameson looking unhurriedly for him, and Jameson glanced at his utterly white face and said softly, We want to get where we can't be seen to talk. There's a devil to pay. No use hiding, said Bell. His lips seemed stiff. Paula? Hide anyway, snapped Jameson. He fairly thrust Bell into an alleyway between two houses and thrust two rounded objects beneath his loose-fitting coat. Two grenades. I have two more. The boat we came in is taken. So is the plane, said Bell emotionlessly. And there's a sign in English posted where we tied it up. The sign says, The Senors Bell and Jameson may recover their boat on application to the master, and may also receive news of a late-traveling companion from him. We're known, Bell told him, and amazingly found it possible to smile faintly. Ribiera met me on the street and spoke to me and laughed and went on. Jameson stared. Bell's manner was almost entirely normal again. Then Jameson shrugged. The sense of what you're saying, he observed wryly, is that we're licked. Let us, then, go to see the master. I confess, I feel some curiosity to know just what he's like. Bell was smiling. Being in an entirely abnormal state, he had a curious certitude of the proper course to adopt. He went up to a policeman and said politely in Spanish, I am desired to report to the master himself. Will you direct me? The policeman abased himself instantly and trotted with them as a guide, and Bell walked naturally now, with his head up and his shoulders back, and smoked leisurely as he went, and the policeman's abasement became abject, and all who walked with that air of amused superiority in Punta Arenas were high in the service of the master. Obviously, these two men and these dejected clothes must also be high in the service of the master, and had adopted their disguise for purposes into which a mere policeman and a slave of the master should not dare inquire. Jameson was rather grim and still. Jameson thought he was walking to his death, but Bell smiled peculiarly and talked almost gaily, and, as Jameson thought, almost irrationally. They came to a house set in a fairly spacious lawn, behind a rather high wall. There were greenhouses behind it, and there were flowers growing, as well as flowers can be expected to grow in such high altitudes. It was an extraordinarily cheerful dwelling to be found in Puta Arenas, but the shuddering fear in which the little policeman removed his hat as he entered the gateway was instructive. They were confronted by four other policemen, on guard inside the gate. Estos, senores, began the object one. Take us to the master, commanded Bell, in a species of amused and superior scorn. 
It is required, senor, said the leader of the four on guard, very respectfully. It is required that none enter without being searched for weapons. Bell laughed. Does the master manage things so? he asked scornfully. Now where I am deputy, no man would dare to think of a weapon to be used against me. If it is the master's rule, though. The policeman cringed. Bell scornfully thrust an automatic out. Take it, he snapped, and go tell the master that the senors Bell and Jameson await his pleasure, and that they have given up their weapons. The policeman scuttled toward the house. Bell smiled at his cigarette. Do you know, Bell, said Jameson dryly in English, I'd hate to play poker with you. I'm not bluffing, said Bell, not altogether. I have a four-card flush with a draw to come. Almost instantly, the policeman returned, more abject still. He had stammered out Bell's message just as it was given to him, and the slaves of the master did not usually disobey orders, especially orders designed to prevent any danger of a doomed man or woman trying to assassinate the master before madness was complete. Bell and Jameson were received by liveried servants in utter silence and conducted through a long passageway, too long to have been contained entirely in the house as seen from the front. Indeed, they came out into a great open greenhouse, in which the smell of flowers was heavy. There were flowers everywhere, and a benign small old man, with a snowy beard and hair, sat at a desk as if chatting of amiable trivialities with the frock-coated men who stood about him. The white-haired old man lifted a blossom delicately to his nostrils and inhaled its perfume with a sensitive delight. He looked up and smiled benignly upon the two. It was then that Jameson got a shock surpassing all the rest. Bell's hands were writhing at the ends of his wrists, writhing as if they were utterly beyond his control and as if they were longing to rend and tear. And Bell suddenly looked down at them, and his expression was that of a man who sees cobras at the ends of his arms. End of chapter 16